Uh, today, one of the interesting challenges of talking about um, this this wonderful theme, thoughtful theme, taking care and writing, publishing and building community, um, is 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 one of the struggles I have as a as a person who is at once a publisher, somebody who promotes and encourages poetry, has built uh, institutions and tried to work on communities to develop opportunities for poetry where there was absence. And in this case, in those cases, whether it's in the Caribbean, in, the, in you know, Black poets in the Britain, and especially the work I've been doing with African poets um, in the last few years, um, there is, there is a, and I, I mentioned this as an interesting tension because I'm an active writing poet. And um, I'm often sort of asking the question of um, how does, how, how is one perceived? Um, and I think people do ask me the question whether one suffers because of the other, but this is absolutely never a concern of mine. Um, I keep generating work and it's interesting to me. Um, and I guess the way that I have managed to operate in these spaces um, uh, is, is, is because of thinking of oneself, uh, to use that term, as a citizen, uh, as an artist citizen. and. Um, and to make the connection between the lived life and the express life. I, 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 and I think that's hugely important. So some of the things I'll do today, talk about today, will focus a lot on my own poetry. Um, but in a sense, I am talking about uh, the idea of, of the function of the poet in society. Um, and there is a temptation for people in my position um, who've lived long enough, I would say, uh, who, who are known to be teachers and mentors and so on, uh, there's a temptation to, to, to be declarative as if what I say is the absolute or some kind of truth, some kind of authoritative truth. And this is even more untrustworthy when I talk about my own work, um, because I just don't believe that um, the experience of every poet uh, is 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 going to be the same, um, and and what our values within a poet do not necessarily apply to somebody else. So my hope is though that um, in the same way that I've learned from other writers um, and what they have said about writing and about their work, and and learned in a way that helps me to to understand something, uh, but then to to then apply it to my own self in the peculiar way that I am peculiar circumstances that I have. Uh, I hope that would, would accrue to those people who are listening to this. It, it, and, and to be more explicit, if, I'm, if, I'm, if, I've, if I say I've been moved by the poetry of Gerald Manley Hopkins, um, I'm, it's not because of a, a notion that um, there's an absolute thing of art and art transcends race or culture or gender or history. I don't, I don't believe that. I, but I do believe that taking Hopkins in the context of his space, his time, his moment in the world, seeing what he does with it and how he wrestles with those things, that is the that is the universal. That that's the element that when, when we dare to use the word universal, that is true. How does an artist, a human being, frankly, function within their own culture and create? Um, and, and so I can take from Hopkins, even if I have quarrels with Hopkins, even if I have quarrels with the edifice that supported Hopkins, that upheld Hopkins, uh, even if I can't apply carte blanche, what Hopkins experienced with what I experienced. But Hopkins is still valuable to me in very important ways. So Hopkins, I understand historically, as I understand myself historically, um, with a kind of veracity to the meaning of that um, history. So it's tem tempting to think of me, I think, for many people to think of me as a political poet. And I often hear these labels associated with poets. Often poets assume such names and titles as a way to distinguish themselves from others. It's a kind of tyranny. And it is also an effective uh, form, form of branding um, that, that apparently works. And we see that increasingly with um, with the ways in which we expect writers to 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 establish themselves on social media, uh, to 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 create networks of of appreciation and understanding, the the entire blurbing system uh, is built around sort of defining oneself and helping people to understand this is the kind of writer that I am. Um, but there's a danger of this kind of labeling. 
um, because of the way that it affects the poet, the active poet, how it exerts a pressure on the poet that can be limiting and debil debilitating, I think. Um, so I'm, I'm always drawn to the kinds of statements about the poet and, the, and poetry that focus on the place of poetry in the life of the poet. Now, I hope that becomes clearer as I as I continue in this conversation. I believe that despite what it may seem to a superficial reader, um, it is this impulse and conception that undergirds the core of, of the, the work of, of, of Langston Hughes, um, whose brilliant and provocative declaration in 1926, when he was just 24 years old, um, he makes a declaration at that time that I think is, is quite powerful. So I'm going to read a quote from, from, from the Negro Artist on the Racial Mountain, that essay by Langston Hughes, 26 year, 26 year, 20, no, 24 year old young man. Um, and he begins with this peculiar and very provocative statement, but I, 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 want, I don't want us to be distracted um, by how he constructs this discussion about race. Um, but to, to sort of understand it within its framework. So this is how it begins. He says, one of the most promising of the young Negro poets said to me once, I want to be a poet, not a Negro poet, meaning I believe I want to write like a white poet, meaning subconsciously, I would like to be a white poet, meaning behind that, I'd like to be white. And I was sorry the young man said that for no great poet has ever been afraid of being himself. I read that line again, and I'm sorry, I was sorry the young man said that, for no great poet has ever been afraid of being himself. And I doubted then that with his desire to run away spiritually from his race, this boy would ever be a great poet, but this is the mountain standing in the way of any true Negro art in America, this urge within the race towards whiteness the desire to pour racial individuality into the mold of American standardization and to be as little Negro and as much American as possible. I mean, what is so powerful and fascinating about that statement is, it seems unfair to sort of place on this poet who says, I don't want to be known as a Negro poet. I want to be known as a poet. Langston Hughes says he therefore means that he wants to be white, which seems unfair to him because he didn't say that. But Langston Hughes extrapolates from it that his anxiety is his, 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 his fear of being labeled Negro. I think Langston Hughes also goes on the rest of the essay to say, how do you do that? How do you be more American than Negro? And Langston Hughes then makes the case that what we call American is what he's describing as white standardization. That is whiteness becomes the prototype of America. You can debate all you want, whether that was 1926 and that does that apply today? There's no question that it still applies today as a wrestling issue, but it's not a discussion about race because the key phrase that I'm really drawn to is and I was sorry the young man said that for no great poet has ever been afraid of being himself. I want to zero in on that because poetry at the end of the day is a shelter for me. In many ways, when I begin with the sincere understanding and recognition that I write to understand what I'm feeling and what I'm understanding and knowing or not knowing, I come to poetry with a full appreciation that my first audience is me. We have this practice these days of talking about writing for the reader, writing for the audience. And that's an invention. And I think if we are going to invent people, if we're going to invent readers, if they are not actual people, then we might as well start with the, the, the true first reader. It's ourselves. There is a primary reader. It's loaded if you think about it. It's loaded because you're managing what you know, what you don't know, what you think you know, what you're discovering of yourself. You're testing it. Sincerity is predicated not by what people understand you to be saying, but what you understand and feel about what you yourself are saying. So that if my first audience is me, and I know that my poems reflect me, then that's the function of my poetry, the function of my understanding. So I want to start with a poem that 
It's called Before the Riot, a poem that appears in, in my new book, uh, Nebraska. And in this reading, I'm going to go back into some poems that I've written years ago and some poems that are more recent. And we'll see how far we can get through. I want to introduce this poem because I'm trying to fully understand and see what the shape and complexity, contradiction, anxiety, and disquiet I felt reading a passage in a book, trying to understand what, what it was about and, 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 and was about such a throwaway colloquialism, but I have to engage it, with it seriously. What is this about? And only when I'm talking to you do I create a narrative of meaning, of origin, of conception and creation. But the truth is, as best as I can think of it, I did not come to the page to write a poem about that moment of reading this book and reading a passage. I didn't say, I'm reading this passage and then say, I need to write a poem about that. This did not happen. And that the reason for that, and this is very, you know, I would say this is my experience. The truth is, as best as I can think of it, I did not come to the page to write a poem about that moment. I came to the page to make a poem. That was it. I came to write a poem. Page, computer, I'm using it metaphorically because it's my, you know, messing around with my phone or my wherever I compose. And so I came to the, poem, the page, to the computer, to the writing, to check in on myself. And this is what it started to look like. I'm checking in on myself because that's why I write, checking on myself. So the poem emerged guided by the constraints, principles, practices of the form of poetry. Poetry has certain forms and it has certain expectations. I've been doing it for years, reading poetry for years. So form and shape, if I'm going to write a song, I know I have to do certain things. But what the content of it is something that emerges, as for me anyway, it emerges. I know other poets think of the whole poem, the idea, the theme, and then come to the page. Me, I've come to discover it. So the title before the riot, I'm sure came after I wrote the poem. It, this is a political poem, but it's only a political poem after it is finished. Not while I'm writing it. It's really a lyric poem for me because the impulse to write it is, is lyrical. It is about me, the artist, trying to unearth myself, the self. And the tension in this poem lies in the thing that is not so obvious, and that may never be clear to anyone reading it. It is a, a fact, a historical fact. As a, a, it's a historical fact, but it's not one that anybody would know. The tension for me is that the writer I refer to is someone I know and care about. And while I was not constrained by a fear of this person ever reading this poem, because I really make sure that when I write a poem, I don't care about, I don't think about who is reading it because I can discard it. Publishing is a different question. It's a different ethical question. Writing, that's a different conception. So the poem emotionally is that the, at the, the emotional heart of it, I know is because of this tension, but this tension is not explicit in the poem. It's not explicit in the poem. And that's what gives the poem states for me, the reader. I think it comes through though. So here's the poem before the riot. but someone will have to pay for all the innocent blood. Bob Marley, from his song, We and Them. On the dreary trudge, the frontier begins. A hundred years later, almost two, a woman says in the way of appeasement, perhaps it is true that for us to live so well, some of them had to die. The question suggested by the nervous lift in inflection at the end of phrase, and who is this us who have lived so well, who are living so well, and how well, so that there is a peculiar justification, a terrible logic, and it is a haunting confession buried deep inside the book. Though in truth, there is no question here. This is its own duplicity, this questioning, this effortless way of speaking the tragic. There has been blood, so much blood, and the rituals of bludgeoning, of rust-tanned white men, cliched 
Westerners, hunters, the stereotypes, the killers of vermin rabbits on the wheel of trucks, the people she knows intimately like a daughter knows a father, knows her brothers, knows the scent of scotch on her grandfather's breath, the comfort of their manliness, stoic as stone, they will kill as easily as threaten even the softer bodies of their women. It is a logical equation, a management of ethics, and who are the dead? the slaughtered and the erased, tribes and tribes whose faces I do not know. Though I know that the logic of this pragmatism, this expiation of guilt, but the embrace of guilt is a kind of penance. It's familiar and the faces of those bloodshot eyes, skins chalky with deprivation, the weary look of slaves, those faces are as familiar as the panting bodies of the football team strewn on the wide grass, undressed in the heat, sweating bodies, broken with pleasure, the familiar look of black bodies, coffered by desire and violence, familiar as this. And that saying, that Darwinian logic, perhaps it's true that for us to live so well, some of them had to die, offered in the soft voice of a Midwestern woman who never rushes her words, who carries in her throat the secret of receiving mercy, a kind of forgiveness, an expiation of guilt, who we count among those in whose mouths ice couldn't melt, mouths of tender duplicity, perhaps, perhaps for us to live as we do. And by this, I mean, we who contemplate anger and bombs and chance today, perhaps it is true that someone will have to pay, as they say. So it's a political poem, I suppose. But it's a poem that is asking this question that Bob Marley asked. He's saying someone will have to pay for all the innocent blood that they shed every day. Oh, children, mark my words is what the Bible say. I may not know how we and them are going to work it out. You see, and I know that Marley's poetic construction of the dilemma his statement, I don't know how we will work this out, is at the heart of that poem. I guess what allows me to write a political poem that does not be that is not doctrinaire is because I'm trying to I'm trying to understand things through my poems. And 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 of course, the human experience, one of the things that modernism has given us permission to do, and by modernists, I mean, you know, the Joyce's, the Virginia Woolf's, and so on. Eliot, Gene Tumors, all of these writers have somehow forced the question of the, psych the psyche and how the psyche is able to bear and carry contradictory impulses at the same time. And, and, and yet the poet is trying to, the writer seems, seems to want to, to lay that all out, those contradictions. This is not new. This didn't begin in the 20th century. But you find it more amongst the poets. Poets have always been engaged by these contradictory impulses. You know, think of Andrew Marvels and to his coy mysteries, you, you, you imagine it's just a seduction poem. But if you think it through, there's a universe that is being alluded to. The whole edifice of colonialism, imperialism and colonial exploitation is still writing as a metaphorical framework psychic same framework at the heart of that poem. So for me, sometimes desire is, 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 is rushing through fear, politically questions, memory, concern about the conditions of the world, wars, deaths, violence, and then the sorrow that always comes back to me. I think of somebody, some, sometimes my father's death, a death that has not become a kind of poetic trigger, has now become a kind of poetic trigger. After all, it was almost 40 years ago, almost 40 years ago that my father died. So yeah, I still come back to that. So here's a poem called Lincoln. I live in Lincoln, Nebraska. And some of these poems, clearly reflect me making sense of my life there 
And so here's an interesting poem that when I read it now, I begin to say, I'm doing so much of questioning, but more than that, I'm also excavating a self and it's a self of place. I want you to be drawn into this little narrative, this seductive, romantic idea. It's a flight and escape and the way that we are rushed back into the present, the moment, and then how memory affects this moment. It's a poem called Lincoln. This low-bellied cloud cover over Lincoln surprises me. The air is muggy and a strange foreboding comfort settles. In the novel I will never write, it is the last day of their meeting, though they do not know it, but this is an opening scene of the book. And after this, the deaths begin. The couple arrives in the three, in the threefold courtyard, a ritual repeated each weekday for a decade, though for festival season and the feast days, they've stayed away. They wait for the teasing accidents of the unseen pianist, always an open chord, not in the same key, and then a quick wayward arpeggio in the higher notes, then the full composition, full body, the nameless air, though they never speak, so all they offer are smiles, who knows what the other knows? The couple dances. In the novel, they have danced for 10 years, a man and a woman, nameless, voiceless, just two bodies seeking assurance in the ritual. Here in this moment of the book, the piano is silent. They stare at the balcony. The curtain flaps as usual, but no sound, no music. Then a portly woman, with a bandana carrying a heavy bag, a heavy rug, steps out, looks down and smiles. She never existed before. She drapes the rug over the railing. It is Persian, curlicues of blue and red, epics unfolding in the soft light. The couple looks away, embarrassed. She leaves first, he follows. The rest is the world collapsing in. A city regulated by guns. Leaders betraying leaders, money changing hands, wars and rumors of wars, snowfall in the summer, a veritable feast for the poets who have mastered the Jeremiads of doom. It was always this way for them, the man and the woman, and the courtyard was their shelter of deep secrets, the kind that accumulates over years and years to become a monument of betrayals, though nothing happens, everything happens. For in a time of calamity, while a nation folds in and starts to feast on its own innards, so much blood, so little peace. Every instant of peace, every escape into music is an act of abandonment. Every poem, a deep sin. Every brush stroke, a betrayal. Every silence, a wounding. On a day as gray as this, the end of things seems imminent. Lincoln's skies are wide as the prairie. The naked eye cannot see the limits of this gloom. I think of this novel of deep silence as a way not to think of those waking to bury their violently dead, those heavy searching for a narrative of anger to allow them to face the day. When my father died suddenly, I sought out the villains quickly. They kept me company for years. They gave me anger for sorrow. They gave me the stoic seething a son of dead old campaigners should bear. They gave me reason to replace the incomprehensible. Tomorrow, I will protest the infestation of guns. But today I sit in the shelter of this city's darkening morning and contemplate the choices of fiction, as in who returns the next day, the man, or the woman, I know one will not. I still can't tell which. I believe this is a political poem, but I believe also that this is a poem of deep lyrical concern. And therefore the poem is a responsible poem. I've said it at the beginning of this talk that for me, poetry 
reflects self. If I am political, then poetry will be political. If I'm not political, then poetry will not be political. Like if I impose a political agenda on my own poetry, then I'm, and, and it's not part of who I think I am, but what I think poetry should look like, then I think I'm depriving myself of what poetry can give me. Poetry can give me the opportunity to understand all of myself, my sexuality, my sensuality, my fears, my anxieties, my guilt, my regrets, my delights, my joys, my anger, my incomprehensible sense of confusion about what is happening in the world, and yet my solutions to those things. Poetry is a space that should allow that if it's going to reflect who I am. And I think this is one of the beauties and the opportunities that poetry gives us. So I just have a few more minutes left. So what I thought I would do is end with a poem. And I end with a poem called The Last Poem, uh, because I think the poem that is, and it's an, a relatively old poem, a poem that I wrote in 1996. It's a poem that appears in a book called Prophets. And it's a weird thing because I think Prophets was a door opener for me. I go back to that book, 1996, if you think about that, that's a long time ago. And if I go back to that book, I realize that something was formed in me already. I'm discovering something in me already. Um, and yet there's a sense in which if this poem doesn't show that for me, the poem is a vehicle for that grace and that beauty and that power, then I don't think anything else could. I say that again and again, because every time I edit a poem, Every time I try to encourage the publication of books by African poets and we try to make it happen, what we are doing is we are, uh, we are, in, we are forcing, we are, in, we are willingly, willing into being the record of sentiment, thought, and feeling, the record of the wrestling with realities, the, re the record of an existing culture and a civilization. We are ensuring that that record exists and it's not erased. That's, that's what I think this activism, this citizenship, this, this push to publish, this push to write and to make space for the writing and to give that, that, that writing space to be, to be apprehended and to be read. That's what it's about for me and continues to be. So here we go, last poem, it's short enough. To paraphrase T.S. Eliot, for us, all there is is trying, the rest is not our business. This I heard perhaps in a dream, but I hoped it was the voice of God easing up some on my burdened soul. But it came not like the wind off the hills, nor did, did the sky flame with the bloody cipher of his finger. This was no nick of time bleat of a scent ram in the thicket. Alas, these were the words of a dead poet with no evidence of salvation, no backative, no promise of returns and blessings for obedience, just the poet's flirtations with the cadence of a god. So I sat among the roses and chewed at the bitter leaves. The weight of the Lord's commanding drooped my broken head and the leaves of the slim volume of verse this quartet this clandestine fantasy this hope for the power of earth makers stone breakers rustled insignificantly and impotently like a poem i hope this was useful and uh helpful to you. It certainly took me to places of thinking about writing, thinking about one's art um, that felt valuable to me. So I hope it does the same for you. Thank you.